having a good day, but I understand there's some snow coming, and thank you for all the good work you've been doing in your local town for plowing and keeping it open. I know the state's been busy and uh, trying to keep our highways open. So did everyone have a chance to sign up if they want to speak? Is there, is there a sign-up sheet somewhere? I thought the league was going to have a sign-up sheet. Yes, thank you. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, they do have a, you have a sign-up sheet? Right now, I do. Oh. <laughs> uh, who represents the towns, anyway? Do you have a league or somebody? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Pass that around, or I can do whatever you want to do. So, if you want to speak, could you please stop? <laughs> um, you are the main attraction this morning. So, um, and we do have a few people who are prepared to speak, and I think you're going to have some others that are. Sure, that's fine. Will, um, feel the yeah. urge to move on. Okay, I think and, uh, the and house. Wins in charge. Okay. Uh, All right. Yes, so, I think the. Uh, the chair, I think, of the House should be along momentarily. Um, so I, uh, I'm Dick Mazza, the chair of the Senate Transportation Committee, and I will have their senators introduce themselves. So we'll start on the other end. Jim McGill, Rowland County. Uh, Jane Ketchum, Caledonia Orange. Andrew Perks of Washington County. Okay, that, uh, and I think uh, Senator Ash should be here momentarily. Oh, okay, well that, uh, uh, the, the vice would chair, you, would you like to do I was going to chair because I'm, I'm vice chair of transportation, Barbara Murphy. I serve uh, Fairfax here in the state house. Uh, Dave Potter, I represent Clarendon, West Rutland, Proctor, Wallingford, and uh, Whisperton. Uh, Representative Becca White, and I represent the town of Hartford. Yay, BLCT. <laughs> <laughs> Former board members. Uh, Molly Burke, and I represent Brattleboro. Yay, Brattleboro. <laughs> I'm Mike McCarthy. I represent St. Albans. I'm Connie Quigley. I represent uh, five towns on the Connecticut River and uh, three Illinois points. <laughs> Patty McCoy, representing the towns of Poultney and Ira. Brian Savage. I represent Swanton and Shelton. Uh, Tim Corbin, and I represent Bennington. Uh, Mary Sullivan. I represent the Southern Hill section of Burlington. Okay, so do we have uh, a list that would like to get started? And again, thank you for coming and uh, share your thoughts with us. Uh, don't Charles praise us too much for all the wonderful work we're doing, all right? Charles Stafford is going to start. Okay. Good. Good, 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 morning. Good, good, good morning. Good to see you, Senator. Good to see you. Thanks, everyone, for your time. Uh, my name is Charles Stafford. I'm the Stowe Town Manager. And I'm also a BLCT uh, Board of Directors member. I'd like to thank you again for this opportunity to testify and for your continuing efforts to keep Vermont moving. I particularly want to thank the Vermont Legislature for amending 19 BSA 306 to ensure town highway aid formula is adjusted annually. With that being said, today I want to focus on stormwater funding. Stormwater management is a hugely expensive obligation for local governments, even with the assistance from the Clean Water Fund. According to the Vermont Clean Water Initiative 2019 Performance Report, out of a total of 13,000 municipal road miles, only 169 miles of municipal road drainage and erosion control improvements have been implemented. Stowe, in and of itself, has 95 miles of roadways, of which the initial ANR screen determined that approximately 48 miles of roadways for a total of 800 segments were hydraulically connected. Towns are required to bring all hydraulically connected roadway segments up to the Municipal Road General Permit standard as soon as possible, but no later than December 31st, 2036. The connected roadway segments that are considered very high priority are to be upgraded to meet Municipal Road General Permit standards by December 31st, 2025. According to a report prepared by engineering consultants, the estimated construction cost for Stowe to bring its very high priority road segments into compliance is $230,000 per year over the next five years and all other road segments $180,000 over the next 16 years. The total estimated construction cost is four million dollars. This doesn't include other stormwater permit requirements such as the three acre rules and the like. The Clean Water Board state FY21 clean water budget recommends an increase in municipal grants and aid from 3.2 to 3.7 million dollars. 
This is only a $500,000 increase statewide at a time when we were supposed to be ramping up our compliance efforts. In FY17 and 18, still received 100% reimbursement from the Municipal Road General Permit projects. By FY19, that was down to 50%. In FY20, it was down to 21.8%. <coughs> In its FY21 budget, the Town of Stowe has increased its stormwater expenditure budget from $75,000 to $235,000 which is an increase of $160,000. The select board is also seeking approval of an assistant engineer to help with stormwater planning and implementation. Total compensation cost for this position is budgeted at $114,413. Even though Stowe does not have any impaired waterways along our municipal roadways, we are disproportionately impacted by road standards and stormwater regulations due to our steep slopes. Admittedly, there are a number of roadways with ditches that do not meet current standard due to our topography, ledge, and utilities. Also, while the community has been a leader in environmental stewardship with over a third of Stowe's 72 square miles being conserved, the community has resisted widening roadways that may involve taking of trees and diminishing of the community's character. So is a tourism community and has more locally designated scenic roads than the rest of Vermont combined. Surveys indicated the number one activity of tourists is to drive around and enjoy her scenic beauty. Although there are some allowances for scenic lines, landscapes, and the Municipal Road General Permit, it is going to be a struggle to balance managing stormwater permitting requirements with maintaining the community's character. While there is a benefit to stormwater improvements, there is also a cost, a cost that the state budget does not appear to fully recognize to date. I encourage you to increase municipal grants and aid funding so that statewide goal of cleaning up the public waters of the state of Vermont does not fall on municipalities and property taxpayers. I'd also like to add what I told Bill Fraser, the city manager of Montpelier at the last board meeting. When towns like Stowe start tapping out and saying mercy, there's a problem. We got a pretty aggressive agenda, and it may seem like a long time frame, but an accumulation of everything out that's going on, I'm not talking about the DEC and perennial stream requirements and turning what used to be culverts into bridges, and that's a whole other range of topics we could talk about. But, uh, I know you folks are feeling the pain. I know the federal government isn't doing its part. Senator Maz and I were talking prior to the meeting. I don't envy your position, uh, but we are where the rubber meets the road and uh, the job's not done. We need your help. Thank you very much. Thanks. Any questions, comments at this time? Thank you. Thank you. The chair just joined us from the house. Hi, I'm Kurt McCormick from Brewing. All right, next on the list. I thought that was just a sign up. Oh, just a sign up. Okay. We did sign up. Oh, we got it right here. All right. Good morning, and uh, thank you all for this opportunity. My name is Eric Osgood. I'm chair of the select board in Johnson. Uh, I, just, I don't have any particular item. I just wanted to share with you how important you know, what you do down here impacts the, the people of my town. Uh, Johnson is very prone to flooding. Uh, about 40% of our budget is on the, is for the highway department, the town's budget, and another 35-ish. So we're, we're in the, is for public safety. So we're in the 70, 75% of our budget is in those two large ticket items. So there's very little left to do other things. But in our transportation highway uh, department in the budget. Uh, there isn't a lot of wiggle room. I mean, just to maintain the highways, it costs a lot of money, as you guys are well aware of. Uh, back on Halloween, the uh, flood event we had, the rain, uh, November 1st, it went into November 1st. From that event, we're into it right now for just over $40,000. Hopefully, uh, FEMA will reimburse us for most of that. There is another area that we haven't touched yet. It was a complete washout. It would be about 20,000 to repair that. Uh, it's an area that quite often washes out every time we have high water. We're not gonna probably put it back the way it was. $20,000 is just a waste of our money to do that. We do, we do have some uh, alternatives. Uh, we had a consultant come in and and did a study for us and 
basically put in a, a, a swale that would allow for when the water comes up, it goes around the bridge and washes right down through, and then when the water goes back down, you'd be able to then go through the area. So it'd be like a low water crossing, basically. Uh, and that's right, it, when the river comes up, it, the mouth where it goes under the bridge is very narrow. It can't uh, take all of the water, so it does break the banks and then washes out the road around it uh, pretty significantly. It is a loop road, uh, so it isn't like anyone is uh, locked, isolated in there. Uh, we're gonna look at two options. One is to either have that swale put in to the tune of about 100,000, if FEMA will, will grant us that, or we're gonna remove the bridge. Uh, the bridge needs a lot of work. It's gonna cost a lot of money. It's, it's an option that we will really have to consider whether we keep the bridge or not. Uh, it's a little bit unfortunate because it's one of only two covered bridges that we have in our town, but uh, I would hate to see it go, but we just, we gotta look for places to cut costs, and it does require a bunch of work. Um, so I just wanted to share with you guys that uh, the money that comes from Montpelier, uh, it is very important to us. Um, we're struggling to keep our budgets in line as you do, and uh, we may lose a covered bridge out of this field from this latest flood. Yeah, unfortunate. Yeah. Yes. Right. Any questions? No comments? Uh, your working relationship with AOT is a very good. Okay. Yes. I, but that's, that's important. I, 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 I have never received any complaints. I thought that was that's good to work with. I mean, the only issue we had with them was in that particular storm, uh, trying to get them there for traffic control. Right, it, right. We were just impacted all over. Right. Uh, we couldn't get Red Cross there okay. because of the storm. Good. It was a lot of flooding. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Taking the time to come over. Next, we have Chet from Killington. Okay, good morning. Good morning. Any snow in Killington this morning? Just a little bit. Just a little bit. <laughs> I'm Chet Barnes, the town manager in, in Killington. Uh, I just briefly wanted to talk to you about uh, funding mechanisms and, and how we're going about it. Uh, the one thing about transportation, uh, the project dictates the funding. It's not a top-down methodology, and, and that's why we're in, a, in what I consider an unsustainable process of how we're funding infrastructure. And, and to talk to the, the Stowe's point of view related to the stormwater, you know, it's a very simple math problem when you know how many lineal feet of, of hydraulically connected ditch lines you have to maintain in stormwater, and you have 16 years to complete it, you know exactly how much that's going to cost in that 16 years. There's no reason to be modifying numbers, and if, and if the state's going to say we're going to pick up half the cost, then pick up half the cost. But whatever that is, the project dictates the amount of funding. And, and, and making sure you do a complete project when you do it. Uh, the example I'm going to use is one where Route 4 passes through Killington. Um, two or three years ago, they, they did a, a repaving job. They did a partial reconstruction on one section. Uh, but here we are two or three years after the project, but we're going to do a major culvert replacement, cutting up the road we just finished repaving. Um, and then the one part of the culvert that's not happening um, is the right at the base of Killington Road, we, uh, four or five years ago, built uh, a park and ride. Um, when we were doing that, we had to extend uh, the stormwater through our, through our site to make sure we were discharging beyond where the parking area was going to be. So when we did that, I approached uh, AOT and we asked them to do the design of what that culvert should be from where it crosses the road, because it crosses Route 4, and we said, well, we're gonna build our structure and our outfall to meet whatever the design standard is that you guys come up with. And they told us it was a 36 inch pipe. So we proceeded to install a culvert with a 36 inch inlet that had a 15 inch pipe running into it. We have a 36 inch outlet. So the state, well, all they had to do the next time they were gonna do a project is 
replace it to the size that they said it was going to be, and that project still hasn't been completed, and that's also part of the same paving project that took place that, that was just completely ignored. And we continue to have ice buildup and damming and things of that nature overflowing the road onto Route 4 right at that intersection. So the issue is, and that is a perfect example, because when I asked the question, why aren't you doing this, and there was a couple of other culverts, why aren't you doing it? Well, we had funding cut. It was originally going to be a complete reconstruction project turned into a mill and pave except for one 60-foot section. And that was definitely a product of the case of, we're going to give you X amount of dollars, and you figure out what you can get done with it, versus what does the project actually take to do it right? And, and we are constantly throwing money away, as far as I'm concerned, and we are not, we are still dramatically underfunding. And as Representative McCarthy has seen, I've shown him my sustainable funding model that actually will tell you if you actually want to do the math, there is a, there's a way to do the math over a 40-year cycle of what you should be funding for every mile of road in the state. And we're not looking at it from that perspective. We're looking at it as how much money do we want to give to it and how we're going to manage the overall budget versus what does it actually need. And we continue to fall further and further behind. That's all I have. Questions? <laughs> yes. Uh, thank you. I have two questions. Yeah. Um, one on the culvert. Is, is your point that the culvert wound up being too small? The one that's being replaced is actually because it was deteriorated. Right, um, but the new one. The, it's excuse. going to be too small. Oh, the one that was too small was an existing culvert, and we were building the, the extension beyond it, and we wanted them to tell us what the size should be, what they were supposed to be building. That's It's too small is why it's overflowing, and it's not a new culvert. And you're not, so you're not replacing the 12 inch? Right. Right. So they did not, they, they came in, did all the work, construction, and did not replace any of that infrastructure. So we have a 36 inch outlet. and outlet. No, it's an outlet of 36 and an inlet of 15. And 12 between. Well, 15 total. It's 15 going into the, into the intersection. Okay. Um, and the park and ride, did you say that you built it? Yeah, we had a grant for $80,000, I believe. From ART? From ART. Yeah. So it was part of that grant project, but I just, I, you know, it, it, makes my skin crawl if I cut up a road that we've already paved in the last five years. And that's why I always ask, what do we have to do underneath the road before we fix yes. the top of the road? <laughs> okay. Thank you. Other questions, comments? Thank you very much for coming over. Next is Brian Osborne and Colchester. Thank you for providing an opportunity for me to come and speak with you today. I wanted to comment very briefly on the DMV miscellaneous bill, specifically the centralized online permitting system that's being proposed to be evaluated for the issuance of overweight permits. Uh, generally, the town of Colchester is quite supportive of this approach. Uh, provided that it doesn't in any way dilute our ability to protect and preserve our public infrastructure and our transportation system. That is our, our, uh, our main priority, but we actually think that going to some type of a centralized system would be much more efficient. And I just wanted to touch upon uh, a couple of things by way of example of what we want to try to preserve with the possible advancement and development of, of, of such a process. Um, the fees that are collected from overweight permits, uh, we would gladly forfeit the five and ten dollar fees if the state were to take the responsibility of issuing <laughs> overweight permits. We're not at all concerned about losing that that revenue. Uh, our our administrative time to issue uh, overweight permits far exceeds the revenues that we receive based on the current statutory fee structure. So we gladly uh, forfeit that. Uh, there does, however, need to be some recognition and provision for specialized fees that are put in place by municipalities that aren't intended to address administrative costs, but are instead uh, specific to uh, individual roadways where those fees are designed to establish a reserve fund to repair the damage to those roadways caused by overweight loads. So there has to be some type of a provision in there that um, you know, if the fees are going to potentially be kept by the state, which we don't have an issue with, those other types of fees that I refer to need to come back to the municipality. They, they are not administrative fees, they are capital reserve fund fees. Uh, that's point one. Point two, 
uh, is more from a liability standpoint. This sounds like a online web-based portal. Uh, I'm not sure whether it's fully automated, but there's got to be some provision to make sure that these uh, overweight loads that are on our roads are properly insured. Uh, we would normally, in a manual system, require insurance certs and review those and approve those concurrent with the issuance of a permit. Uh, there has to be that capability within, within this system. Uh, and I would take that one step further, uh, at least from Colchester's perspective, we actually require uh, permanent overweight loads on their insurance certs to name the town as an additional insurer. The, the underlying insurance protects us from the standpoint that if they do damage to our roadways. It doesn't necessarily help us if we get sued as a result of something that happens on our roadways relating to an overweight load that we permitted. So I would throw that out there. Um, point three, um, any permit that the municipality would ordinarily require must be required of the state system. There can't be any, uh, you know, uh, a process where the state may not uh, permit particular overweight loads that we would have otherwise permitted on our local roadways. So it really needs to mirror anything that the municipalities would have permitted. And then lastly, uh, we need to preserve the flexibility to, uh, in, the, in the permitting process to address uh, conditions that change rapidly throughout the year, as you know they do in Vermont. Uh, sometimes we need to be able to invoke weight restrictions fairly rapidly because of changing conditions on our roadways. Maybe we have an instability issue on a road or a bridge or something like that. And we need to be able to maintain that, that level of flexibility. So again, we're quite supportive of this. If it's done properly, the devil's in the details. Uh, we're happy to, to work with you and others uh, to see if we can get that. Thank you. Well, I guess the, the initial thing was that all we were trying to do is uh, instead of uh, the town dealing with 100 50 different requests with different truckers, centralize it so it'd be easier for everyone. Right. But I, 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 you know, I take your issues in consideration because we don't want to jeopardize anything else other than the fact that it'd be easier for trucks to have one instead of filling out, like you said, 200 rooms or whatever. So, any other questions or comments? Yes. Yeah, one of the things that we heard uh, from the bus and truck folks was the level of the fines that the towns can issue if they don't have the local permit, which they might not even know about, or the changes and things. How do you feel about a change in the, the fine levels to, to be more in line with, you know, the infraction? Um, I, I don't know that they're necessarily not in line. To be honest with you, I don't. I don't particularly. When I look at this in totality, I don't particularly see that as a problematic area. I think. I think what's in place now makes sense to me. I understand that it may not work for everybody. It may not make sense to everybody, but I. We don't really take issue with us. So you wouldn't support it changing the lowering of the, the fines. No, would or would, would not. No. <coughs> Questions? Comments? Thank, Thank you, you very much, Brian, for coming over. Appreciate it. Okay, next, Chelsea Hoyt from West Fairley. Okay, good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> good morning, and thank you for this opportunity. I'm uh, coming to you from the Town of West Fairley, population 675. All right. Um, town of West Fairley. Um, <laughs> We don't have a road crew. Um, we have, we contract for all of our services, um, which means that truly the management of our town highways falls on the select board. We're very fortunate to have a local uh, contractor who lives in town and takes huge pride in um, the way that our roads are managed. He is very forward thinking um, and it's, um, it's been a good setup for us. We don't own a shovel. <laughs> um, and our select board you know, is a very diverse bunch. Um, and there's just a total commitment to making our communities better. And that's, that's what we're working towards. We live here 
in terms of transportation. We drive the roads. We're checking out the next town's road work, even. Um, and we're really good at keeping um, everybody rolling. You know, when something goes wrong, we hear about it. Um, when everything goes right, we don't hear from anybody. <laughs> but, um, we know about that. But you know, exactly, you can relate. You know, but to keep moving forward, you know, we got to count that as a win um, as well. Um, in terms of some of the, the you know, the recent uh, the MRGP, the municipal um, road permitting, um, it wasn't new to us. Those are practices that were in the codes and standards, you know, working along. It certainly has accelerated um, that work. It has helped us prioritize that work as well. Um, it's expensive. You know, our budget is going up and we don't know how much further it's going to have to go up. You know, every year is a little adventure and, um, in that, that way. Um, one of the things that's really important to us that, and we appreciate is are the resources, the people resources. It's particularly for West Fairly, it's essential that we have access to folks who have a practical working knowledge of highways, you know, how to construct them, how to manage them, and safety. Um, one of the disturbing trends that, that we see is, is a trend to kind of undermine local governance rather than collaborate. You know, to kind of place our towns in the crossfire of some interagency um, jurisdictional spats that have to do with, with our highways. And I do appreciate that our legislature, legislators and these committees have a pretty good nonsense filter. Um, for lack of a better word, um, to see that. But there are a couple things coming down the pike. Um, one of them is, has to do with uh, um, you know, fairly innocuous sounding legislation on updating the tree warden statutes. And when you read it, it's really more about usurping control, town control, local control of our right of ways. Um, and we need to have that to maintain that control for, for safety and just for, um, actually, I sort of back up is that if anything, towns do far too little um, trimming and cutting in their right of ways. It's expensive. And particularly in terms of everything else that's coming at us, it falls into a really low, low kind of priority. Um, in terms of that, proposed legislation's series of hearings and um, notifications. We talk to the landowners when, we're, when we don't want to get the phone call. You know, uh, when our work is going to affect somebody's lawn <laughs> in getting rid of a berm, you know, we're talking to those, to those landowners. Uh, we like our trees, we leave trees, you know. Um, so this is not an issue. Um, another sort of pending or up upcoming or proposed uh, bill is um, H240, you know, which uh, takes fourth class roads out of the Better Back Roads uh, program. It doesn't change the fact, it doesn't change the standard that we have to meet on that class four road. It's going after a funding source that is competitive. If we feel our fourth class road project is gonna beat somebody else's third class road project, it should be in there and it should be for the reviewers to decide on the merits um, whether it should be funded um, as well. Um, we are appreciative of the resources that are coming to us through Vermont Local Roads, Absol absolutely essential. Shout out to District 4 Trains, <laughs> who's very responsive to us and, and our questions. Again, we're, we're on the front lines. It's not our, we don't have a road commissioner. Um, that we're trying to, to navigate this, some of these, these new um, 
regulations. Um, and once again, we just we need to be sure that those <coughs> regulations are coming at us from those that have, through the channels of agencies that have practical knowledge and not some sort of other agenda in managing our roads. So thank you very much and thank you for all that you do. Thank you. <laughs> Questions? Comments? I, I do have a Sure. Um, sure. Uh, the first uh, bill that you referenced about the tree warden is, uh, I'm, uh, in the, I'm not familiar house with it. Is it a house bill? It is a house bill. It's H673. It's because it's for uh, it's forest and parks. It's before uh, ag and forestry. What you're pointing out is there. so often legislation has collateral impacts, and it, um, and you're identifying absolutely what would be absolutely. Okay. Thank you. You said you had 600 miles of road, or, uh, or 600 population. How, how do you plow your roads? I guess I missed that. How, I'm who, sorry? Who plows your roads now? We have a, we contract for oh, all contract. our road okay. services. Okay. Say we have a local. So you don't have a road, road program of your own? I mean, uh, Delcy's also the road commissioner. I am the road commissioner. Oh, yeah. Okay. So okay. is, is the road commissioner. Okay. And it's, it is. I guess I missed that. It's a great contract, That's and it great. works well for Good. the town, and we do oversee you know, all of the materials separately through the select board and that sort of thing. Well, thank you very much for coming over. Appreciate it. Okay, we have, uh, let's see, Peter from Brattleboro. Uh, we've already done that. And next one is HB from where? Where's that? Sorry, that's me, H.P. Valenta. Okay. Uh, this gentleman as well. Oh, sorry, go right ahead. I heard you say Peter from Brattleboro. Maybe yeah. I jumped the gun. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Okay, I'm sorry. Go right ahead. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Um, good morning. I'm Peter Elwell. I'm the town manager in Brattleboro. Oh, okay, there we go. All right. I'm okay. here today with uh, two members of our select board. Um, Tim Wessel is our vice chair, and Liz McLaughlin is a member of the select board. Um, we're here, actually, um, Happy to share some um, good positive feedback with you about VTrans and oh, we like to, to add to the ask about stormwater management. So, Thank you. Um, we've had a lot of communication with VTrans in recent years. Um, there's a major interstate highway bridge project. Right. Um, there's been quite a few different um, safety uh, issues that have been addressed and some planning to address some um, other bridge replacement and other uh, infrastructure projects that are coming um, in our area. Um, and particularly um, pedestrian and bicycle safety issues that are really important in our community um, that we work a lot locally and collaboratively um, around and need partnership from the state and have received really good partnership from the state. So um, we want to let you know from Secretary Flynn and Wayne Simmons on down you know, through the entire team, um, it's a pleasure to work with them and um, we appreciate the degree to which they keep the promise of wanting to be uh, partners with local government uh, addressing these needs. Um, and it's in that spirit that we um, join Colleen Charles and others in uh, asking that that same spirit of partnership extend fully through how um, we're all working together to um, improve and protect the waters um, in the state of Vermont. And um, there's, we, we completely understand the necessity, you know, the federal requirements that the state had to face and come up with a way to address. Um, we're not flinching at all at the responsibility to do um, significantly increased work um, in, uh, related to the roadways and other aspects of protecting the waters, uh, but we're not getting near enough financial help. Uh, you know, this is a classic unfunded mandate in that um, the requirements are requiring you know, exponential increases in the cost of doing this work, um, not just along the roadways, but um, in the entire package of, of improvements that are required. But specifically in the roadways, um, I think each one of us is seeing you know, already doubling and tripling and more um, and knowing that it's, it's going to increase even further in the years ahead. Um, while the state aid has increased, it hasn't increased nearly enough. And we would ask you to please, um, you know, as the transportation advocates, work with all of your colleagues in the legislature um, to make sure that within the prioritization that has to happen up here, um, that more state funding is made available to municipalities since we are indeed at the, uh, 
the point of the spear in implementing the improvements. You're right. It's uh, it's a big issue. We're we're trying to work our way through. It's a, it's coming as a surprise to a lot of us uh, because it is be becoming a big issue and. One of the factors is we haven't heard much from the federal government at this time of what their plans are for infrastructure over the years, and we, we need to we need to work together, and that's uh, so we hope something comes along sooner rather than later. Any other questions or questions from? Yes, I have one. Uh, thank you for being here, Colonel from uh, Balboa, uh, and it's it's not related to anything that you've mentioned, but uh, I'm interested this winter in snow and ice removed from sidewalks, uh, especially in places where it seems to happen many hours after the adjacent street is cleared. Do you guys have a policy or a, a, what is your practice? So there's a combination of different ways that we address that. Um, in the downtown area, the um, building owners are responsible and normally through the, the uh, merchants who operate downtown businesses, they usually take care of the sidewalks um, directly in front of their buildings. Um, They're the, required by, by ordinance. By ordinance. Really? Yes, sir. And then um, out, moving out from the downtown um, to into neighborhoods, and particularly along corridors to schools, um, we do run um, sidewalk plows. Uh, we have a pair of sidewalk plows that are operated by our public works department. Um, we actually only had one for years and struggled to keep up with that need. Um, and uh, town meeting a couple of years ago funded a second uh, sidewalk plow, and that's made a huge difference for us in terms of being able to um, keep uh, safe uh, pedestrian pathways in that developed center of our community. Um, further out than that, um, we have a lot of circumstances where you know it's, it's all dependent on what people choose to do out in the neighborhoods for themselves, um, and in many cases on our more residential streets, we have folks walking in the roadways. But um, down where it's more of a um, public shared space and the the need to keep uh, the, the sidewalks and crosswalks safe. Um, we, we do that in that combination of ways. One particular challenge, this may be um, more detailed than you hoped for when you asked the question, but we have found that the combination of um, public and private effort um, required through the ordinance and through just partnership um, has worked well for our community. But one place where we have fallen down over the years is um, in the downtown area at the intersections in the, the access from sidewalks into crosswalks. Uh, seems like a little thing, but it's no man's land in terms of the shared you know, divvying up of responsibilities that I've described. And so we've actually separately contracted now um, for individuals to go into the downtown area and shovel those connecting points out. Um, we do find that you know, it's not a perfect system. There are times when that particular task will lag behind uh, the, the clearing of the other um, routes, but um, until we address the issue. No, I actually am interested in those details, and I will pursue them with you uh, after. Oh, that'd be great. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Senator Ash, um, a question I'm not sure if this is something that the town or through VLCT have thought about. You're probably aware of the Transportation Climate Initiative discussion amongst a number of states, and yep. while all the details are not fully out, uh, the governor and the legislature both wanting to see how it would work for Vermont, which I think each of the potential states is doing. Just wondering if you've had local discussions about the wisdom of the approach or if it was going to happen, how the resources, how the municipalities would want to see those resources utilized. Sure. Um, we've not had local discussions specifically about um, that, um, that initiative, um, so I can't comment um, uh, substantively on the sharing of that particular, those, those particular resources. Um, I would ask just in general that, um, again, in the spirit of the partnership, the fact that you know your constituents are our constituents and we're actually in um, addressing local needs in direct communication all the time around transportation issues and all other issues, um, that when it comes to looking at um, new responsibilities and new opportunities, that we do that as collaboratively as we can. Uh, we, we welcome the opportunity to be up here with you as you work through your work. Um, we really appreciate continued support for um, when you identify a way forward that's good for Vermont, uh, that's gonna rely on municipalities to be out at the front end of implementation that, that come with the resources to help us succeed. Thank you. Other questions? Thank you very much for coming. Thank out. you. Appreciate it. Yes, uh, okay. <laughs> what was the name again? I'm sorry. Thank you. Thank you. 
Good morning. Heidi Bridge-Valenta from the Town of Highgate, Town Administrator. And um, I appreciate this opportunity very much. I had not planned to come, but we did, um, several municipalities received a notice from BAST yesterday, that who manages the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail, that um, this might be an excellent opportunity to just um, speak about the completion of the Lamoille Valley Rail Trail through our communities. <coughs> Um, I did plan to come with uh, the Swanton Economic Development Coordinator also because both of our towns are um, on a segment of the trail that is languishing, has not been completed in the very long time that other towns have been benefiting from their completed segments of the rail trail. And um, this may not be the ideal spot to speak about this, but um, it is a, a great audience, so we just wanted to take the opportunity. Elizabeth wasn't able to join me, but this segment of rail trail is significant to Swanton and Highgate and the significant opportunity that it would um, open up for us for economic development and tourism, and it is really an opportunity that should not be kicked down the road again. Um, it, it, the can should not be kicked down the road again. It is really um, <coughs> significant as both of our towns are working so very hard on um, bringing a focus back to economic development and tourism and what we can do to help ourselves. And all of the focus on villages has been a spectacular support um, for improvements and the rail trail will make a dramatic difference to us as we attempt to get a leg up and <coughs> revitalize those communities that have been stagnant for a very long time. So I won't speak long because I wasn't prepared for this and I um, don't have a lot of data or facts, but it is an impassioned plea to put that money into a project that will reap great rewards for our towns, our region, and the state in what it can benefit. So Thank that you. is, in a nutshell, my message. Questions? Senator Monson. Yes. I, it's more of a statement because I really appreciate you bringing that topic forward. And I just want to reiterate that in house transportation, it's something we have heard about over the last half dozen years. Um, for me, anyway, I'm sure it's been there longer. And I just want to say that it is, 90, it, when completed, will be 95 mile trail from east to west of our state. So I think that it really is a broader picture for our state. It's, I appreciate the communities that are still yet to be connected, but the whole picture is really quite exciting. So thank you. Yes. Uh, and I want to add to what Barbara said. Um, uh, I think you can be helpful while you're here in the state house to talk to people on the institutions committees, at least in the house, because that's where the capital construction budget begins, and that's what the governor has proposed to pay for 20% uh, of it, the other 80 would come federal dollars, federal highway dollars. Um, and I want to say that I, I wrote on it um, past uh, October, wonderful trail, and um, uh, lobby while you're here. <laughs> We're convinced. <laughs> and I'll just say it is one of the more spectacular segments. <laughs> so the whole thing is. Thank you. It is. It's a real. It's a very. And you're from Swanton, did you say? No. Highgate. Highgate. Adjacent. Yes. Uh, the bridge in Swanton. Right. Is that one of the recycled highway bridges? Yes, that was originally a, yep. a railroad or a bridge uh, that came from the town of Yeah. They Great thing. Bridge. Some of these trusses are no longer worthy for highways, but can be for uh, a bike path. Absolutely, and Hagen like does have one over the um, right. hydro dam, a yeah. historic Hello? Yeah. 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 trust bridge. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Jeff Winberg. Oh. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Great. Jeff's not a stranger here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Deeply appreciate yes. the opportunity that the two committees, the two committees provide to the lead members on these uh, 
local government days, and it's a bit of a tradition, and it's one that uh, is much appreciated, not just by myself, but by, I'm sure, everyone else here. Um, I'm going to change the subject a little bit here um, and speak to, first of all, express thanks particularly to the House Transportation Committee for uh, taking up the question of the master license agreements that were a source of litigation between the City of Rutland and, and VTrans um, last year. That the, the railroad contract. The railroad, yeah, the, yeah. Crossing, yeah. the crossings uh, issue. And uh, that litigation has been resolved out of court by settlement, thankfully. Um, and so, you know, Rutland is in a good shape right now, but the legislature required uh, in the uh, transportation bill a study, and the study um, gave about four charges to uh, VTrans and also uh, required the involvement of the league, which is much appreciated. I have to say, in when we received the study, we received it with a significant amount of disappointment. Um, the in, in some critical respects, the study really does not respond to the legislative questions, the questions that were posed. And I'd like to, I don't want to go through the whole thing, and I, you don't have the time, and I'm sure there are more important things that others would like to bring up, but I'd like to cite a couple of them that are particularly troubling. Um, the, uh, in the summary uh, of the master license agreement, the terms and conditions, that is a standard agreement that the uh, agency and the railroad require municipalities for um, doing utility infrastructure, water, sewer, stormwater infrastructure at rail crossings, at roadways. Um, there are several things in there that are uh, not, not fully addressing the concerns that the municipalities raise. Uh, particularly the very first one, description of the authorized facilities, the state point, the first bullet point on page uh, under 1.3, which is the summary. The state and railroad retain authority to approve or deny approval to the utility for additional facilities. First of all, Rutland, and to my knowledge, nobody else has any objection with the state and the railroad having to approve the, the installation of new water, sewer, stormwater lines mm -hmm. at crossings. Um, it's only appropriate that they have to review the plans and approve them to make sure that they're in compliance with all of the federal and state and, uh, and uh, other standards that are, uh, are necessary. What that summary doesn't include is what we were objecting to, which was the fact that in addition to approval, municipalities are required to surrender across all of the crossings within their jurisdiction, and for the life of the MLA, any right to appeal a decision, an adverse decision, a denial with which the municipality might object. So it's not the approval. The approval is perfectly reasonable. It's the requirement that we have to basically take whatever answer we get, and we can't go to another tribunal, a court, or otherwise, and challenge that denial on some reasonable basis. The, and getting to that point, down uh, at the bottom of the page, under five, indemnity and public liability, and I'm only going to hit like three points, so I won't go through the whole thing, I promise. The very first sentence says, and it's reasonable, the utility, in this case municipality, acknowledges that its use, its uses, meaning the presence of these, uh, these pipes and so forth, may expose the state and the railroad to additional liability to which they would not otherwise be exposed. That's a statement of fact. It's perfectly reasonable. But that's where it stops. And from the municipality standpoint, the presence of the rail line across the municipal right-of-way or over the utilities exposes the municipality to additional liability to which they would not otherwise be exposed. In other words, there is, there is a balance here. And there's a tension because commerce and, and public safety are very much at issue with both roads and railroads, and those things need to be harmonized. But critical utility infrastructure, water, wastewater, stormwater, public health, public safety, environmental protection infrastructure is equally critical. And there needs to be some recognition of a balance 
in an effort to try to harmonize these things. This, this, this agreement, the one that is currently uh, required, makes no attempt to do that, and that is our central objection. Um, there is there's also the, the uh, irrespective of the negligence on the part of the state of the railroad, um, all the liability for anything bad that happens goes to the municipality. Uh, that's still in there. And um, then there is a, a, an opportunity to appeal a decision regarding maintenance um, of facilities, but all the core routes of appeal are all within the agency of transportation. They're all controlled by the agency of transportation. There is no independent third party such as the courts. And that does not extend to new or proposed facilities, only for maintenance or, or uh, upgrade of existing facilities or utilities. So that's, that's an issue. Perhaps most troubling of all is that under two point, uh, well, two, two, uh, there's a list here under table one of approximately 50 towns and cities that have master license agreements with the state. This is great to see this list. We had requested this previously and it was not forthcoming. And we've also requested to actually look at the master license agreements for these 50, and that is not here. Nor is there a summary in here of the nature or the date that these master license agreements were signed. Many of them date back to the 90s, 80s, and 70s, and we've reviewed a few of those, and quite frankly, we would have signed one of those in a heartbeat. It's the more recent ones, the ones that require this additional language, these new requirements, we don't know how many of these actually contain that language, which is, which is not fully responsive, I believe, to the request. Finally, um, 4.0, insurance. Um, the statement here, and again, I'm going to go back and actually read what your request was. Point number three in the legislation, whether a municipality municipally operated utility can secure sufficient insurance coverage to, ent um, to enter into the agency's current iteration of the standard conditions to the master license agreement it uses when a municipality, utility, or other person needs to use the right way um, for the line of the railroad owned by the state. And the response can be summed up in a sentence midway through. And it's, you know, the existence of MLAs with Vermont municipalities or municipally operated utilities were listed earlier in this report in Table 1, that there are over 50 MLAs suggest it is possible for municipals, municipalities or municipally operated utilities to, to secure sufficient insurance. It is curious that the agency didn't pick up the phone and call any of the 50 that they have on their list to simply ask the question in response to your question, did you get insurance to cover this, this shifting or imposition of liability? I don't think they did because I'm quite sure they know the answer to that question, which is not contained in their summary or in their report. And that is that the insurance doesn't exist. You can't get it. We tried. In fact, the railroad, Vermont Railway, tried diligently to find any product out there in the marketplace that the city of Rutland could secure to make it possible for us to sign this agreement. And they couldn't find it, VTrans couldn't find it, and we couldn't find it. So I think it's much safer to assume, not that these 50 municipalities have secured insurance, but that they have gone ahead and executed these agreements. We don't know how many contain this language, but they, some of them have. That they've gone ahead and executed these agreements without insurance. And placing all of that burden onto their residents and taxpayers, which is somewhat ironic because in a smaller community in particular, in Vermont, there's no such thing as municipal bankruptcy. Under our constitution, if a municipality becomes insolvent, that burden goes to the, all the people of the state of Vermont, essentially to the legislature. So by imposing this requirement on municipalities, and in the event that something very expensive and very horrible were to happen, and the municipality was insolvent in an attempt, an effort to re respond to that or to uh, meet that obligation, that obligation goes right back 
to the state. It's almost as though the state is shifting this liability onto itself, um, which makes no sense at all. So uh, there are a number of other uh, concerns with the report, um, but I would encourage um, the committees to um, question this. Now, one other thing. As I said, Rutland has our, our issues resolved. We haven't been required to have the master license agreement. We went to mediation, court ordered mediation uh, with the agency and with um, the railroad. And on the day before the hearing, on our second mediation, uh, uh, the railroad uh, president, um, whom I personally am friendly with, and, I, and the mayor is particularly, uh, has, a, has a good friendship with him, so this, these were difficult. <laughs> This was difficult litigation because we actually like these people quite a bit. Um, uh, got a letter from David Wolfson essentially saying, okay, go ahead, build your project. You don't need a master license agreement. Um, the, the, the process and the litigious process that we were both engaged in was such that it would get in the way of critical public health, public safety, environmental protection infrastructure that needed to be built. Um, and since then, we've had another project that we've gone to them and we've got another letter. So one would hope going forward that the $100,000 plus that we expended in legal costs to get to this point has resolved our issue. But it does no good for any other municipality in the state. And I would add that it was the funding for that came from the Drinking Water State Revolving Fund because these are eligible project costs which means that under the 50% subsidy, the state of Vermont paid for at least half of our litigation against the state of Vermont. Um, those dollars really ought to be spent for drinking water and storm water and wastewater and CSOs and those things. It shouldn't be spent on lawyers fighting over these things. Um, and other communities may follow our suit, and that would be tragic if there is a way for the legislature to encourage uh, or otherwise um, find a way to, to modify some of these requirements in these MLAs so that we can get out of this conflict where we do have potentially conflicting goods and interests, safety, health, etc. But there has to be a way to resolve these things um, short of litigation. And I would strongly encourage your efforts, whatever you could do, to help bring us together on that, on that. But you've done a lot in, in getting this information, even though it is disappointing in what it doesn't contain. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? Anybody? I yes. guess I would just add yep. to, uh, say the mayor, the uh, commissioners. Commission. We only have one mayor. He's not here. <laughs> um, to his comments, my disappointment in, in the report was it seems to rest on um, the fact that they're common, that these agreements are, are common around the country. And to me, that doesn't mean that they're okay, <laughs> they're good, but like, would you agree that's pretty much what it rests on? It, it, there's there's, a, there's, this, a, this is how it's always there's a multi page table in the report for surrounding states, and it summarizes some of the key provisions in there. If you read that, of course, we study these things obviously in Rutland. If you read that carefully, and I, I can't say this from knowledge because I haven't read the standard MLA conditions in Connecticut or Massachusetts or whatever, but if you read it carefully, it would seem to suggest that the more onerous requirements that are here are imposed on municipalities, municipal utilities in Vermont are probably not present, at least not to the same degree, in many of the surrounding states. So yes, master license agreements are common. Actually, they're a very good thing. Um, the stated purposes of it in the front of the report, we totally agree with. Could not, we would love to have one. It, it simplifies and clarifies relationships and responsibilities. It is a handful of requirements that are being imposed here that are, we are objecting to. 95% of the content is perfectly reasonable and appropriate. Okay. Yes. Oh, um, I, I did read the report. I read it, and I had a hard time saying, "What do I do with this?" 
and uh, because we were aware that the city of Rutland was really the genesis of the language and the difficulty that you've described, you're saying that the, the legislature really needs to take further action. I'm just wondering if, um, if there is some kind of written document or whatever that could go with your oral testimony to help us determine what action you would like to have um, considered and what legislative remedy um, would address it because um, I know the league had expressed its displeasure with uh, the report in terms of helping to guide future um, decision making and legislative remedy. Well, last so year. Is there, uh, is, maybe you've already done that in, in the House transportation. In, in, uh, Representative Fagan from Rowan City introduced a bill that um, went into the House Transportation Committee and that evolved into the study. Um, but that bill um, contained language that we believe would have resolved this. Now, there are probably a dozen other ways to do it. It's not the only way to do it, I'm sure. But that that would be a good starting point. That legislation? Yeah. Okay. Which ended up with the study that, that, that now? Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank Appreciate you very, it. Very, very much. George Putnam, Cambridge. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for this opportunity to meet you both transportation. Thanks for coming. Uh, George Putnam, I'm select board chair in Cambridge. First, I wanted to uh, add my support uh, for the Memorial Rail Trail. Uh, that uh, segment from Cambridge to Morrisville has been a big boom for Cambridge. And uh, when that segment is completed to the north, that will be uh, uh, a bigger boom to Cambridge and towns along that. So, certainly want to uh, encourage that. The main thing I want to talk about is state roads in Cambridge. Uh, the main state highway in Cambridge is Route 15, and uh, I want to thank the state for rebuilding that road from the Burlington area out towards Lyle County. The last couple of years that uh, reached almost to the edge of Lyle County, and the next couple of years that we'll get into Lyle County. That's a very important road for us. It sees a lot of commuter traffic. It sees a lot of uh, solid waste. <coughs> Several trucks a day on that road from Chisholm County out to the landfill in Coventry goes to Cambridge. So that's Only a very important part. Only several? <coughs> Multiple, I guess. Uh, <coughs> so appreciate the, <coughs> the, the uh, resources the state is putting into that road. Much of the economy in Vermont depends on tourism, and I hope the state is also paying attention to all the roads into the ski areas. Earlier you hear heard Killington and Kurt Trail Safford and Stowe. Route 108 through Smuggler's Notch was recently rebuilt on the Stowe side. And uh, my one big ask today is to pay attention to Route 108 on the Cambridge side from Jeffersonville up to Smuggler's Notch. That road's in tough, tough shape. And uh, anything you can do to speed the uh, rebuilding of that road would be much appreciated. That ski area is very important to the economy in, in our area, as is uh, Stowe ski area on the other side. Any questions, comments, anybody? <laughs> I'm being prompted because we did look at a um, map in our committee room of the intent and um, asset management of our highways, and I did notice a discrepancy in which side of the mountain 108 happened to be upon. <laughs> and I, I mentioned that I didn't think that there should be a discrepancy with those colorations. Well, I know we'll, we'll see if it goes anywhere. <laughs> the, the whole road through the notch is a scenic byway, and uh, so it sees a lot of summer traffic as well as, as winter traffic. As I said earlier, one of the factors are, is that we, we have to uh, hope that the Congress comes up with some new infrastructure plan throughout the whole country because it's an issue all over, and it, we're still working with the same amount of money, luckily this year. but. Uh, I don't know what the future is going to bring, but uh, we certainly would love to give more money out if we have it. And uh, because there's a need all over the state, it's infrastructure improvements all over. So uh, any other questions, comments? Thank you very much for coming over. Appreciate it. Did I hit everybody on the list or did, is there anyone else that wanted to speak that didn't sign up? Did I, I thought I got everyone on the list, but maybe, yes. 
So Mayor Lucas sharing city with Barry. Okay. Uh, I wasn't going to speak, but because of everybody else, I, I thought it was well. You know, make a couple comments. Uh, one, is, it's just take advantage of those, uh, other bills that you might see out there. Um, there is a bill Peter Anthony introduced for the the trestle to remove it in the city of Barry. It's a flood hazard on one end, but I just heard uh, there's a Lamoil Valley Rail Trail that could use a, a trestle to go over. <laughs> take action in one place to support another one, I think that'd be great. Um, the other one was about the, the plowing and if uh, plowing the sidewalks before roads. Uh, one of the things is just the logistics. So if you plow a, a sidewalk first and then you plow the road, where does the snow go? It goes on your sidewalk. So part of it is you, you kind of need to work from the inside out in order to dispose some of the, the, the field. So I just wanted to provide those two comments. It's nothing too uh, specific, but I just thought it would be something to bring to people's attention. AOT put a few hundred people down in, in town of Barry, right? In the city of Barry. Oh, town. and we love them there. Um, <laughs> and some of the legislation that was spoken to earlier about uh, having uh, streets maintained by some of the uh, butters, I think that is uh, a great way to try to prevent cost savings. Um, having e trans there to help us understand more of our own uh, paths and, and trails, I think is going to be great. The more that we can expand the side of a sidewalk on one side of the street versus maybe on both, you could use part of that as the storage for the snow in the winter. It makes one route to go down. Uh, some of the plows that we have, they're the older plows, you can uh, use them because if you go down a narrower section, you either have to stop or go around a light pole or something like that. So just logistics in general. The, the better you can do those processes, it, it'll save costs in the long run. Okay. Questions? Thank you very much. Well, I think, Thank you. Can I just? Yes. I, I think we have to ask you to repeat the, the sidewalks and the streets because our, oh. <laughs> our chair just returned it. It's a, sure. It's a perennial question. Yeah, just the, uh, I'll give the, the quick overview. If you uh, have snow on the sidewalk and in the road, uh, the logistics would be if you plow the sidewalk first, then you plow the road, where does the snow go? And it ends up on your sidewalk. So if you uh, are able to plow the snow on the road first, you can come back through and get that snow along with the snow on the sidewalk to remove it further out. Then the sidewalk would blow up the highway. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not to your lawn. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Anyone else this morning? We have to pay. Yes. I wasn't going to, but as a conversation earlier, and I'm not about money. So oh, good. Like me. <laughs> <laughs> Two things. <clears throat> As you know, Motor Voter is connected to our uh, voting portal from DMV. The two questions I would like to see addressed, or would like to see addressed, is the application for a driver's license asks for the physical address. But people give a physical address as their mailing address, so the mail, it doesn't get to the proper one. Or they give a physical address that is not coinciding with our 911 address, which is tied to our voter registration. So it doesn't match up to addresses in our town. So constantly we're getting changes of addresses from more voter that really don't need changes, so we're rejecting those because they're not matching up to anything in, within our town. So it'd be nice if motor voter could match up to 911 so that there wouldn't be rejections or all constant change of address. The second thing is there's a yeah. clarifying yeah. question on that. Is, is, it a, um, is it an input issue for, is it it's a software input, issue? Input, it's a software issue on, from Motor Voter, sending it to our town, and when we go to enter it, it's, asked, it's telling us there's an address change, okay. when really it isn't because, for instance, in my town in Dorset, we have US Route 7, we have Vermont Route 7, we have US Route 30, and people are just putting down Route 30. So it comes in as an address change, and I look at it, I'm like, oh no, they're registered, they're here, I'm rejecting it because they're not giving their proper 911 address. And, the, and our voter registration is matched up to the 911 within our towns. So that, that's the problem. And then the second thing is, most recently, you, um, your committees were talking about emojis. And no, we're not. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, yeah, the Senate committee was not. Okay. <laughs> Okay. The House Committee. The House Committee. Well, I have a couple of constituents in my town that want the American flag. But the only way you can get the American flag is if you're a veteran. And I'm, veterans are very dear to my heart, but so are my citizens, and they would like to have the American flag as a possibility. They're not worried about the smiley faces or anything else, but 
I, the American flag, so I called, and the American flag is attached to a series, so it's the American flag with a V, and then, but I don't understand why the American flag couldn't be offered to anybody who is proud of being an American with any number or a specialty plate after it. So. Okay, yes, go ahead. Well, I just, we, we actually in the house have several requests for uh, license plate changes and individualizations. And I have to say, I have now decided that my opinion on this is, and it is true, the license plate belongs to the state. It's actually not yours. And so I think that we could maybe start redirecting that to some other process where potentially VTrans can supply 3M bumper stickers that people can put on. I mean, it, I, I think that it's, it, the license plate has a purpose that becomes diluted the more and more different they all become from each other. And so that's just now become my reaction is that it is actually a state property. It's, it's not ours. Why is it not ours, though? We don't get You have home. to return it. No, you don't. You're supposed to. You're, you actually are supposed to. <laughs> well, <laughs> Once again, there's a well, uh, place. We, we, the house gets the message. People have license plates hanging around their houses. I've got okay, lots of okay. plugging holes in their barns. And <laughs> okay, okay, yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, just to throw out as, a, as an idea, that we, we uh, we got a lot of news attention about the, the emoji bill, which was a short form bill, which we have not spent time discussing. There are many, many uh, bill proposals that are up on the House Committee's wall about specialty plates, ideas for specialty plates, ways to modify them, having vanity uh, stuff on specialty plates. I'm starting to become of the opinion, not because of the property issues that Representative Murphy reference, but that we should just get rid of specialty plates. <laughs> it would be a lot easier. So I, I, I take your point that the, yeah. that there's a real public desire around. We're not, not going to have plates. that discussion here today. But yeah, there's, <laughs> I just want to throw that out there that, 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 that I think we may be heading in that direction. <laughs> would you identify yourself again? Oh, I'm sorry. Sandy Pinsonall, town clerk of Dorset, okay. and also on the league board. Thank you. Uh, Appreciate it. Okay, anyone else today without emoji plates? So we don't have, <laughs> we're not going there. Or any kind of plates. Are, are, are we all set? Thank you very much for taking the time to come over.